Yeah, I have um, followed Natalie's work for some time, and um, I would love to have you here just to keep talking for hours on end. Um, but tonight we have Megan Smith and Jean Case with us to talk and, and to extend the conversation. And we're going to talk about science, we're going to talk about technology, we're going to talk about engineering. We're also going to talk about art. We're going to talk about creativity, inspiration, innovation. We're also going to talk about opportunity and empowerment. And a word that Jean Case uses a lot, fearlessness. Great. And given that these three here on the stage have a depth of information and experiences to share that we could probably all be here all night long. So I hope you brought your blankets. <laughs> um, but I'm going to just delve right in. Natalie, thank you again for your presentation. And clearly, Natalie is an example of why we need to be seeing artists at the table when we're talking about solving the world's issues. Correct? Yeah. People Terrific agree? example. Of and that is really the goal of Women, Arts, and Social Change, is to insert the arts into the conversation, to make sure the arts and women are part of the conversation. And so I just want to talk, and we're seeing it slowly, like, you know, organizations um, like at the World Economic Forum in Davos, we're seeing artists being recognized for their contributions to social change. The city of Boston, like some of the cities you've been working in, Natalie, is creating an artist residency to really talk about change in the urban environment and to bring mm -hmm. artists in to address those issues. How did you get to being an artist for whom social re responsibility is really a driving force? And can you talk to that aspect of what social responsibility as an artist means to you? Yeah, I think actually the interesting thing about being an artist in, in the realm of, you know, very complex, technical, social, environmental, global circulation models, waste energy systems, is that nobody trusts an artist. <laughs> you know, nobody, you know, you don't have, artists say that climate change is a real concern, right? Artists say that, you never hear that, right? Artists have no authority. That doesn't matter how many PhDs they have or where they went to school, you know, they, you know, they're kind of tricksters, we don't know so if to believe them. So is that why you had to go get a PhD, is to, to gain <laughs> multiple or three of them? No, <laughs> no it's, it was because, um, I think as an artist, you, you're only as persuasive as the things you produce, these experiments, right? It's not because you're a professor and some <clears> at MIT. <throat> it's because, oh, it's sort of, the artist stands in for the everyman. If an artist can do it, then anyone can. <laughs> if they can do a biochar-cha, then, you know, it's this idea that it kind of popularizes, because artists are incredible, first and foremost, to the public, right? Or to themselves, some may think. Right, and I think or that's to the collector. That's the issue that I had. An, I, you know, it's not enough. I had to articulate my ideas in terms of what I thought the common good was. So I've done a lot to institutionalize this idea of um, uh, of health, because um, you can have people who are pro-development and anti-development, and left wing and right wing, and you know. The thing about urban culture, right, is that you have tremendous polarization. How do you get any kind of concerted action? But this idea that no one is anti-health, right, yeah. that it's the, it's the environmental commons, um, and being accountable to that means that it's wide open for any kind of wondrous engagement, convivial learning, public experimentation, betting, um, you know, anything. If it measurably improves human and environmental health, then we, we agree on something, right? Okay. So that, that was interesting and important for me to, to find a way to be accountable to something. So the concept of responsibility, social responsibility, social change, I'm going to jump to Jean because the mission at the Case Foundation is described as supporting the best impulses of entrepreneurship, innovation, technology, and collaboration to drive exponential social impact. That's pretty <laughs> freaking amazing. Yeah, that's um, really long. We say <laughs> we invest in people and ideas that can change the world. And I think the common fabric between what we often call social innovation 
and art, but it's true really of any kind of innovation and art, is people are dreamers. Mm -hmm. They have the ability to actually have an idea of something that others can't see and of creating those things as reality. Um, and in most of the innovation that we back, we see, uh, we may not call him an artist, but trust me, there's an artist at work somewhere in that soul if they're innovating. That being present. Yeah, Absolutely. because they're dreaming new dreams. Right. And Megan, innovation is an important aspect within your office. It's like one of the italicized um, <laughs> comments. Can you tell us a little bit? I, I think you have this amazing title, but I don't know that a lot of people know what you might do. What we're do. trying to do, yeah. You're the, not working on the computers in, in the White House. I, yeah. Some people that we've brought there are doing that, and that's part of change is people. Um, so the president started the chief technology officer position with this administration, and I'm the third person to do it. Um, the idea is how do you help the president and his team harness the power of data, innovation, and technology on behalf of the American people and the people of the world? And so we've been really focused in three areas in our team. Uh, one of them is around policy, the nature of government, and bringing technical people into those conversations. And they're kind of the topics of the day. So last year, a lot of net neutrality. This year, um, encryption and cybersecurity and uh, patent reform and copyright and uh, open education resources and those mm -hmm. topics, as well as technical people and other policy conversations where technology has an impact on almost all aspects of society. So just like we have a Surgeon General, we have a top economist, we have a top lawyer, we should have top digital people in the room as we decide not just underneath to implement or out to be the vendor partner, which of course is where you're gonna go when you're ready to implement, but not right. in the architecture. The second bucket of work that we've been doing a lot on is uh, digital, open, data-driven government. You know, if we're the country that could make Amazon or Facebook or Twitter or AOL, these incredible companies, those Americans should do a tour of service in the government, and we should have resumes that all of our digital techies, just like our legal teams. A tour of service in the government. Yeah. <laughs> so. If you talk to most lawyers, they will have done clerking. Right. You know, um, if you talk to economists, they may have come into government. The scientists come as AAAS fellows. Uh, the medical, all, all of our people, except the digital people, hmm. they're not doing the same kind of tour of service where we're flowing back and forth at the same rate. Sometimes in the intelligence communities and certain, it's, it's certain areas, NASA, of course, mm -hmm. but we're uneven, and we want to have that for HUD and the Department of yeah. Labor and the Department of Education, and we want these digital Americans, just like the others, to rotate in and out. And so in that sector, we've created um, presidential innovation fellows for the beginning, like mm -hmm. a White House fellow or a Peace Corps volunteer, the techies who come for a year as entrepreneurs and residents. Last year, there were uh, 28 presidential inf innovation fellows in 11 agencies. We get about a dozen a quarter. Please come and serve for a year. Uh, then they created 18F, which is at the General Services uh, Administration, and it's a technical group, hundreds of folks who used to work at Facebook and Twitter and Amazon and Dropbox, who now work in the federal government uh, as digital techies. Wow. And they come for between six months and four years. And then um, after some of the various challenges that we had with websites and other things, we created uh, the US Digital Service, which is embedded at the Office of Management Budget and in agencies. So they're in. Uh, Department of Homeland Security and State Department working on the visa systems and immigration technologies. They're in the IRS improving all the data science and technology for us to, to use that census. You know, there's an incredible idea for the iPhone or for Android of these software developer kits, you know, so you can build apps. So now the census team is launching City SDK, City Software Developer Kit, okay. that can come. Just like if you took out your phone and you looked at the weather, You'd see this beautiful data science of icons of it's cloudy or it's raining. That sits on top of NOAA. You know, and then the billion dollar weather industry is there. Can we take every department, agriculture, labor, and have an incredible industry on top of it of extraordinary resources for the American people? So people are getting busy doing that with all the agencies and working together with incredible colleagues. And I would say that the exciting thing there is that there's just extraordinary people in this government who are here for mission-driven reasons, and so bringing this extra teammate uh, is making a big difference, so that's been great to work on. And then the last area we work on we call Innovation Nation, which is how do you get more of the American people 
into the kinds of jobs we've been part of, like things like tech hire using code boot camps to fill the 600,000 open jobs in our country in tech that pay 50% more than the average American salary, but people aren't coming in. So how do you use creative things now? We have 35 cities. And then how do you use these really innovative ways to solve problems uh, in this innovation nation uh, on our most intractable problems, real child poverty? Uh, broadband connectivity for everybody in our classrooms. And so those are the areas we get up to, and that sounds like kind of everything, but it's really bringing new methods and capacity building our incredible colleagues with some of these new ways of doing things, which very much include art and design and design thinking right. you right. Know, in that practice. So that brings me to something. When Natalie came in today, almost the first words when we were, she's like, well, what am I doing with, May how did you connect Megan and I? And you know that we know each other really well, and. You know, the three of you were really and have been in the space of the beginning of what is our new time. digital technology yeah. life. Really long time. And Natalie had seen that Steve Jobs movie and was like, dude, there's one woman in there. And we were there. We know, I talked to Megan and I'm like, where'd, where'd we go? And so this crime of a mission, which is obviously very near, it, it is the founding mission of this institution is to correct the crime of a mission of women who've been left out of art history. I have to give one quick shout out. Uh, the um, Name Five Women Artists. Name Five Women Artists is a hashtag campaign that we're doing. And um, so please, if, can you all name five women artists? But can you also name five women scientists? Can you name five women in technology? And um, you all were talking about how the women were actually there and how the art was also there. Because I, you know, we were sure. talking about Apple, for, for, for example. Yeah, that they get you erased. You don't have Apple without the arts. That's right. Um, I was lucky to just be on stage with Joanna Hoffman. Uh, Kate Winslet just won the Golden Globe for playing Joanna in the new Steve Jobs movie. One of the things that's interesting, if you look at, um, if you look on the web for original Macintosh team, Steve's original team, uh, you can see these pictures from Rolling Stone magazine. And one of the ones that's really striking is, um, it's a pyramid of them kind of like a cheerleading team. And there's seven men and four women and a baby. Uh, and uh, the four women are not in the movies, and the seven men, most of them have speaking roles. And it's just you know, debilitating, because uh, people need to know about Joanna, who was product manager. And there was a moment I actually was watching the movie, and I could see the insidious sexism in every line, because I know these people. And one, at one moment, I wrote to Joanna, I'm like, we should do like mystery science theater on this movie, and <laughs> just say what like, really happened. And she's like, I'd love to. And she said, you know, I, she said, Jeremy, my son, uh, when we saw the movie, he, we came out. She's from Eastern Europe. She's a physicist from MIT. She's totally intense. And her son says, Mom, did you really iron his shirt? <laughs> and Jeremy said, Jeremy, I have never ironed a shirt in my life <laughs> except once. And it was for you because you had to go do whatever it was. You know, he was 14. So, but Hollywood thought the woman should iron Steve Jobs' shirt. Do you want to talk right? about so that? Right, so how do right. we help our colleagues, you, you know, not do that? Being perplexed by that, and I want you both to have a chance to talk about it because you were there, and how did you get there? You were there. Yeah, well, actually, Megan and I do go back a very long way, and it's, um, and we, I was there, um, and uh, in fact, um, at Stanford, where I was doing um, engineering PhD, and um, I was working at Xerox Park, and, of course, you can't do an engineering, you know, a PhD in a technical field and not be brought into this question of how do we address the attrition rate of women and minorities in these technical fields, in these challenging technical fields. Um, and so, in addition to designing um, Gravity Probe B, I was working on the optics system for that, we also did a lot of research on looking at how it is that the pipeline of technically educated women keeps hemorrhaging, bleeding women. And when you look at the data and you look at how, um, and there's been big National Science Foundation consortiums to address this, um, and that actually funded some of my um, graduate work, you see that actually the women in engineering and technical fields have a higher GPA, and yet they drop out at a higher rate at all levels, at high school, undergraduate, doctoral work, even as professors. Um, they, they, the attrition rate keeps going. 
And what's interesting, when I, there was lots and lots of interviews, and, and it made sense to me, um, because these exit interviews, as they're called, why did you leave engineering? Why did you leave computer science? Why did you leave? The answer was always something like, I wanted to help people. And so it wasn't actually that this was, you know, culturally, um, you know, difficult, you know, hostile environment. It wasn't that it was, it was just a massive social protest that, you know, that military and, uh, you know, things that didn't have real social good attached to them seem to, you know, women and minorities have the same pattern of wanting to do something good, wanting to... So in, in uh, where I was, in the biomedical, there was one faculty um, who had nine graduate students, all of whom were women, and he was in biomedical, right, because that was directly helping people in a way that, uh, um, you know, a cybersecurity system mm -hmm. or a military application had less um, direct, tangible. So I thought that was an interesting thing, that it was a... It demonstrated a massive social protest that there is really a tremendous interest in the social. But that was the perception that being in that field is that's what it meant. But that I don't think idea. that was universal. However, yeah. you know, I worked for the nation's first online service, which predated AOL by quite a number of years. And as I looked around there, and then as I went forward, and we ultimately built out AOL. I would say people working in that field were really on a mission to democratize access to information and ideas and communication. So I think tech is, a, it's not a universal thing that those working in tech didn't necessarily feel they were benefiting society. I think we, we deeply, deeply felt that as we were building out the internet for universal access, which you know ultimately we did, because we understood it could level the playing field. Um, but there, you know, there were a fair number of women that in the earliest days of sort of tech in the internet as I looked around in terms of my peers in the company. And it turns out that women have played a really pivotal role in technology for all time. The first person that ever wrote what we call today a program was a woman. Mm -hmm. But chances are you don't know that unless you read Walter Isaacson's book, which <laughs> brought it alive for everyone again. Ada Lovelace and the 1800s. You've done a great job, Megan, at the White House. And you should really go online so you can Google it. Women in Science and Technology, where we talk about Grace Hopper, uh, an early Navy um, I don't know what her role was. She's rear, she became rear admiral of the Navy, but her original, uh, original work was during the war in the Harvard team um, in the Mark I, doing major calculations, including the, the major calculations in the Manhattan Project. But then she went on and she had this idea as they started working in this tech area um, that you could get a lot more people to be able to use this technology if you could write in an English-like language rather than this machine right. code. And people felt like sh that was a crazy idea. Why would you do that? <laughs> and so she said, we're going to do it. And she figured out how to write what became COBOL. And so now we have Java and Perl and you know all these wonderful languages. And, and that was a woman, and her name was Grace Hopper. Yeah. And I bet if we said, how many people have ever heard of Grace Hopper? How many Hopper? of you guys have there heard of Grace Hopper? There wouldn't be many. Okay, Hopper. that's wonderful. Yeah. That's much you more know, than we find. But this we is did true. Saying, saying Hopper is like saying Edison. <laughs> yeah. Saying Hopper is like saying Edison. It is like saying Edison. And, and in fact, one of the know. things that we've tried to do at the foundation is put a spotlight on innovations that came from women out of science and technology. And they're everywhere. Many of the things you enjoy in your everyday life were brought to you because of brilliant ideas that women had that brought them forward. The only problem is they just didn't get the spotlight and the megaphone that some of their male peers had. So it's not like they're missing. You know, we have this wonderful statement that we love at the Case Foundation, which is talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. And I think we could probably add to that, maybe spotlight is not either, because as we look back through history, no matter the sector, mm -hmm. as, as you were pointing out, you know, we can find women who had transformative roles, but somehow got left on the cutting floor when the story was told. Mm -hmm. One of the famous American stories I always think about is the Chicago World's Fair which a lot of people think about in electricity and sort of right. the fight between Edison and Tesla and Westinghouse and that. But there's some other stories that are very profound from that. Um, one of them, you know, just to take a simple invention, um, 
So the invention of dishwasher, right? Uh, that's when a he invented the invention. dishwasher, yes. that became ultimately KitchenAid. Uh, it's you know, and her, her design is still exactly the design in your house, um, you know, with some upgrades. But it's an amazing thing. But even more significantly, uh, Ida B. Wells, who was one of the mm -hmm. country's most significant data scientist, journalist, amazing woman, um, a technical and journalistic woman, um, with Frederick Douglass, protested the fair because they wouldn't let African-American inventions be distributed and shown at the level that they deserved. And so this sort of lack of visibility and access and being part of the community for sets of people is a real challenge. And it's one of the things that the president has been really pushing us and working with us on. And we did the first ever White House Demo Day this year, and we had 90 entrepreneurs talking about many zip codes uh, from 30, 30 different companies from all over the country, Mississippi, Wisconsin, everywhere, uh, as well as Silicon Valley and Austin and Boston. And it was great, and we were able to really push and talk to colleagues, because uh, this is a countrywide lift to make this culture change that we have to make. So we were able to reach out to the venture capitalist community, get them committed to changing the partnerships, changing who they're funding. 3% of venture capital is going to women-led companies. And Less yet, than 1% to African-American Diverse companies. teams, How do we change diverse it? founders are outperforming those right. that are not diverse. So, right. you know, so but again, it's a story up. we just need to get out there. And that's, yeah. that's interesting. One of the, um, on your blog for Forbes, you uh, quoted Thomas Edison who said, I haven't failed, I've just found 10 thousand things that won't work right and I think about one of my an favorite artist quotes. practice in that aspect but what we were just talking about is where are the incubators that actually are inspiring enabling and empowering diverse audiences and diverse individuals to get engaged to feel engaged whether it's the current millennial generation who are entering the They're workforce. They're out there. Yep. We're backing and many of them and trying to put a spotlight on. How do you bed for those beyond? Yeah, early. well, I think what we need are some really early, you know, opportunities that we can spot, like great stories of women and people of color who were given opportunities that they otherwise might not have. You know, I think one of the things our study of entrepreneurship has really taught us is, you know, we tend to think, oh, if I just got capital, I could take my idea forward. Mm -hmm. But in fact, that actually comes kind of late. Long before capital, you need to be in social streams of yeah. people who can lift you up, introduce you to a network, bring you along. And so this idea that there are incubators and accelerators mm -hmm. around the nation that are specifically focused on helping women, specifically helping people of color, it's really transformative. Because will they need capital? Yes, they will. But long before they get to the capital, they need mentoring and they need networks that lift them. That many of us might have had the privilege to have access to. You know, we like to talk about Mark Zuckerberg. We love Mark. We think he's a great guy. But basically, when he built Facebook, he just had to go knock on the door across the hall at Harvard University to his rich friends <laughs> to get his company funded, all right? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Most people don't have rich friends, and most people won't go to schools like Harvard. So how do we bring all the players on the field. I think that's really the opportunity we have. And you know, it's funny, we were talking to someone in the press yesterday and she said, is this like affirmative action? And I said, no, not really, because some people would say affirmative action was a problem we need to, needed to solve, and we did. This hugely is an opportunity to seize. We are under leveraged in the nation. Startups are our economic engine. Innovation is our economic engine. And we're leaving most of the players on the sidelines. Yeah, and it, it, one of the things I'd love to share with you guys is that, uh, you know, and, and there's in, in all the interventions that you can be doing all the levels with the adults who are here, whether it's tech hire and quick boot camps that get into coding jobs and then becoming entrepreneurs, whether it's access into the networks, the community of innovation, which is live and well in every city of the country with tech meetups and others, but most of the people don't know it's there, so right. how do we bridge those gaps? One of the things that we're doing this week is called National Week at the Labs. And just like National take your week at the National Week at the Labs. Labs. Okay. And so just like take your kid to work day. Um, this is take your kid to the lab. So uh, over 50 federal labs have opened their doors to kids in the communities. They're reaching out through My Brother's Keeper, through Council of Women and Girls, through different groups to primarily underserved kids to have them have that first experience of like an active STEM engaging fun field trip day, that spark day where you come. And we know from all the research that all of us who came into tech, um, it's through really four key things. One of them is to experience or practice or know what this is, but not in a listening to other people, but doing it, you know, that moment with the lightning ball, the striking thing, whatever it is that catches you, 
um, having heroes or people that you can see that are like mm -hmm. you. And so this visiting labs, we're gonna be able to let these kids, we, should, we expect many thousands of kids to go this week. Plus uh, communities are also doing lab activities and we wanna expand that. It's the end of Black History Month, it's the beginning of Women's History Month, so this is the lab week. The third is, uh, is um, impact, that you wanna know what's the purpose of what we're doing. Right. And the right. fourth is encouragement. And so if we really get those things for the kids, most people will want to become fluent in this, and we really, in the 21st century, you know, whether it's the President's sort of Computer Science for All, or this uh, entrepreneurship programs, so we call them STEM Plus. You know, how do you get all the Americans? Did you say STEM, STEM Plus. STEM Plus. STEM Plus. Is that arts. STEAM? Well, arts, entrepreneurship, <laughs> innovation, like STEAM, STEM. Yeah. Community. Well, come on. Get yeah, no, it's an important. It's an important point. You know, we haven't talked about. So I have the true privilege, and I'm actually new to the role of being chairman of National. That Geographic was my next Society. question. <laughs> the and first woman in the magazine's 128-year history. <laughs> Thank you. Society. You know, but I've I've learned a lot in the decade or so that I've been working um, with the society, and one of the things I've learned is that everything we're talking about tonight. You know, it goes nowhere without a good story. And in some ways without an artistic story mm -hmm. that also includes compelling images that can change the way people feel about National an issue. Geographic opened the world up to a small kid who grew up in Loxahatchee, Florida, had never gone to an art museum. And National Geographic, through amazing graphic design, amazing. I remember that from the 70s. Mm -hmm and through fantastic images. Yes, and most people don't know, but Alexander Graham Bell was the early president of the National Geographic Society. And when he took over, it was kind of a dry, little, brand new, late 1800s, dry, not boring, but definitely more, you know, very scientific kind of newsletter. And he said, why can't we ignite imaginations? Why can't we put people on the front lines of exploration and discovery? But to do that, we need it to be a compelling magazine that draws people mm -hmm. in with great images and storytelling. And so for all of us that, you know, maybe recall thumbing through those pages or your first, maybe in your grandparents' house or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, we really have Alexander Graham Bell to thank for having the vision to know, and it goes back to what we're saying, there's cool stuff happening everywhere. There's Great. cool stuff that has happened, that women, people of color, men, you know, you, you name it, have done through time. But the only way we find out about them is through compelling storytelling and compelling images. And in many ways, that's art. So to your first mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. you know, you can have a lot going on, but if nobody ever sees it or knows about it, yeah. You know, it sort of stops there. And it, this sort of touches into, I have a great colleague uh, named Andrew Coy, who um, in Baltimore, he took one of the old rec centers. And he, uh, you know, in addition to basketball and all this cool stuff that we can do in the community, he created a maker space. Mm -hmm. And he has Nano for the little kids and Mega for the big kids. And the big kids start teaching little kids. It's do you want to talk real thing. quickly what a maker space is? Because not everybody Yeah, so knows. a maker space would be if you went to your high school and you took kind of the shop room, the home ec room, the art room, maybe a little bit of the science lab, threw it all together and all those kinds of tools and things or, were or together. Or visit Natalie at the environmental health Yeah, just, <laughs> you know, a little bit of the, the playground. And, and it's this cool space you come in and it's a very open space and people say, hey, what, you, what would you like to make today? And you, you kind of come in and do passion projects and you see everything from, you know, somebody making a new business, Internet of Things. Really, if you think Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak with their first board, they were you know, tinkering. that was a maker, a maker yeah. experience. Martha Stewart, we were talking about earlier, you know, maker ideas. So that's what a maker space is. So this is for the kids. But Andrew says he often thinks about how we teach and how we separate the subjects. And it's sort of like we say to the kids, let's make this great bread. Okay, so here, eat a little flour. You know, how about you have the water? I'll give you some yeast. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm not eating bread. I'm eating like these things that I can't figure out how they're related to each other. And so I think your point about the storytelling, um, and especially the storytelling about the people, the who does this work, is really important because it does, it's, these are not inanimate things. And often when you go into technical museums, I find the team photo isn't there. 
Who made the Lunar Lander? Well, I met Joe right. Gavin. He was the manager of the Lunar Lander. He has the most extraordinary stories that I got to hear from him. And his photo and the teams and the fact that they had a 24-hour clock and how fast they had to build things and they would hook things to their wrists so they wouldn't leave tools in because of the weight constraints and their concerns about the astronauts kind of coming back. Those stories aren't in the visual of the lander, even though we love it when we go near space. So how do we bring the stories alive with I, this I work? I want to actually add that I, I think it's also changing who's telling the stories mm -hmm. as well. Yes. And, I, you know, just the concrete example with um, the hands-on maker spaces, which I like to call make it better spaces. Nice. Um, uh, actually, um, you know, we know they allow the kind of interdisciplinary, you know, the kind of peer-driven, but yes. they also allow the discussion about the problem forming. And so the feral robots project that I skipped over and sort of designing curricula that make spaces for telling those stories where they upgrade the raison d'etre of these robotic dog toys and they sniff out concentration gradients of industrial contaminants. And you release packs of hot rotted feral robots on contaminated public sites, the press turns up. And the press turns up and says to the kids who have programmed the dogs, what are your dogs finding? What does that mean? What do we do about it? And it changes. And do you know who talks to those kids? The, uh, the Rather first... than Natalie going to the press and saying, you have a toxic yeah. waste exactly. in the landscape. Exactly. So it's an opportunity to say evidence-driven discussion and the complex public processes to invite, you know, 15-year-olds in the Bronx is where I Citizen did that Citizen engagement into the issues. And no next question. generation high Very schools. Powerful. This yeah. is about next generation high schools. And you know, how do we have our young people get to work on the real problems of the day that they're very passionate about? Um, data science and justice, data science and earth science, um, you know, passion projects, agriculture, all of this work, entrepreneurship, as part of their coursework as they come through high right. school and middle school and even elementary school. So to wrap, because I want to turn things over to the audience when we get to Catalyst really quick. Each, every, Every one of you is doing something that is really about innovation and social change and impact. Um, can you name one example of a change that you personally hope to see in five to ten years? Yeah. More opportunity for all. Really a leveling of the playing field. I think there's great innovators in every inch of the world. It's not, you know, about one place. It's not about one kind of person. It's about how do we truly open up the tent and invite everyone in and create comfortable pathways and opportunities for them to come and do what they do. So for all of you, that's one of your tasks to think about as your strategy for change. How do we create more opportunity for all so we get there in that five to 10? Megan. Yeah, so maybe it's in the story about Alexander Graham Bell. Um, when he first came to Boston, he was a teacher of the deaf. And he happened to go to a lecture at MIT. And uh, the MIT philosophy is very open. You saw them do open courseware and other things, and now edX, that work. At the time, they also thought that way. And so he just was in this lecture. And so he asked if he could come play in the lab and be part of the lab. And it's in the lab that he did all of his fundamental inventions for the telephone. And with the piano as well at home. Yeah, and it's, it's this idea of... Um, Everybody, like this, this teacher of the deaf, this creative person who wasn't necessarily the person who was in the, you know, the acoustics It wasn't lab obvious that he'd yeah. build a telephone. He did it because he wanted to help deaf people communicate. So yeah. he was very fascinated with sound technology. So, so is the so, change? So in this, what, what it is, is it, one of our biggest challenges in this country and in the world is people don't always know each other who could be helping each other with the things they really deeply care about. So how do we just do better um, of being more open system, open source. Mm. It's definitely the move of the 90s, whether it's open source that came in tech or whether it's Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, <laughs> of South Africa, this idea of transparency and the internet and the network of all of us and how we collaborate and how we share. And I think your idea of mutualism you know, is, is right in there and that, that's what you have as an opportunity. And it's not singularity, it's plurality and what we each care about. Each person really cares deeply about something and how do we come up underneath each, of a, uh, each other as entrepreneurs 
um, and the teams that do these things. So thinking about how we can cross mix uh, all of our cities, all of our regions, and, and really help all the entrepreneurial spirits, whether they're gonna express themselves through an artistic path, a, a, a visual path, a technical path, or the mix of all that as we make the bread. Natalie. Okay, I get to restate, um, uh, I mean, great. The word we started with? Well, yes, you know, what we started with, mutualistic systems design. But really, transforming our energy systems to distributed local power production, waste energy systems, micro-hydro, initiating a project at the moment with a Pequot to take, Pequot were the first uh, genocide, incredible mm -hmm. group of um, uh, Native Americans who are still here, Pequot in Vidkus, um, to take the 5,000 dams, dam dams, that are still in Connecticut, preventing eels and shad and alewife, you know, decimating the system, to transform them each into fishways and microhydro to generate local energy, local wealth. We've driven an industrial revolution with microhydro before. We could do it again. Distributed local energy production is a really big challenge to transform our energy systems away from uh, coal and uh, integrating vegetation into the urban environment, creating food systems that are delicious and high one. nutrient. I know. I know. So there's quite a list here. I'm not taking notes now. These are, these are the technologies of the 21st century. Do you all know how to solve these problems? Say yes. <laughs> We're all going to adjourn. I want to thank our fantastic group of speakers here, Jean, Megan, Natalie. Okay. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you. It's up to you all.